<clears throat> so good morning, everyone. And again, um, lovely, to, lovely to see all of you. And thank you for joining today morning. And again, um, as usual, I would like to start with a short breathing, mindful breathing exercise to quiet your mind and calm your mind. And we can try to have good intentions by thinking and feeling may us coming here together. <clears throat> Given our precious time, may it become cause and condition to implement and apply Many of the advices that are given by the author that we were studying, by great Atisha, as much as possible in our life. So that we can become more compassionate, more kind, more patient. more ethical and more wise with more wisdom. And with those inner qualities, may we be able to be more help and more benefit directly, indirectly, to other sentient beings. And may us coming here together and studying together, become cause and conditions to actualize all the realizations within our mind stream and to achieve fully awakened state as soon as possible. So we can be there as help and benefit to each and every sentient being. Okay. <clears throat> I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create to listen to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. The love and the love and the love and the love and 
Sajo Padavan. Sagisha Jagi Vesum, the Lot and the Song and Yoma. So we have been discussing Adisha's um, Bodhisattva's um, guidance of the jewels, and which is full of a lot of advices, practice, instructions. And um, we were in the sections where um, Adisha advised um, to let go of any kind of clinging attachment and craving for a, uh, external material wealth. Instead, we should try to, you know, uh, work hard to cultivate the inner wealth, uh, the, the seven area wealth, um, because those wealth, uh, those seven area wealth are the well that can be meaningful, helpful, beneficial while we are alive, at the time of death, after the death. The external material things, well, we don't know how much it might be beneficial even while we are alive, at the time of death and definitely it can't be much help, any help after the death. You know, so therefore, um, you know, um, he encouraged and um, and give advice to cultivate those inner seven inner area wealth. And those seven area wealth, you know, the first wealth is the faith, and we discussed a little bit last week. The faith, what is the faith, and three different kind of faith, you know. And again, you know, faith is very important. Uh, in one of the suttas, Buddha said, you know, without the faith, you know, um, there is no way inner realization, inner realization can be um, achieved. Uh, it's like a without faith, it is like a seed without any kind of help of moisture, you know, water, moisture. And so similarly, faith is very important. And we discussed last time, you know, not only faith, but the faith that is, um, we need to cultivate the faith that is uh, rooted in, uh, you know, your own, rooted in the reasoning, logic, and experience, you know, and so um, which is important. And um, so the faith that is developed on the basis of, you know, reasoning, logic, and experiences, then that kind of faith is play a huge role in our really um, growth in our spiritual path, in our spiritual realizations. And so that, that was a, um, one of the, the inner wealth. Um, and as it is said, you know, as, um, the other one is the moral discipline. It's another inner wealth, area wealth that, you know. And again, moral discipline is another important factor. Um, if we live our life, you know, more ethical, more moral. We have less feeling of guilt, regret, remorse, less feeling of self-loathing, bad for ourselves because we are we act as immorally. You know, so when we think about those things, sometimes it we can feel negative about ourselves. You know that I have acted such a immorally and we that could be one of the factors for some people you know self-loathing self-hatred and so and then you know um, also it helped us to be more transparent and less fearful you know 
you know, nothing to hide. So when you feel like you have nothing to hide because you are transparent, you have not done anything kind of immoral, ethical, then you have less fear of being exposed by being known by others, you know. So again, that makes our mind much more, much more calm, peaceful, much more happier, you know, because we don't have to have all this kind of fear. We don't have to have this kind of worry. Um, we don't have to kind of try to hide anything, you know. Um, so, you know, uh, mm. so it makes your mind much more peace, you know, peaceful, you know. Um, and of course, uh, the, the practice of moral is uh, again one of the mental, you know, virtuous mental state. You know that that act as an antidote towards you know immoral mental state and actions. You know, um, and it is in in Sanskrit, it is uh, moral is kind of shila. Shila means kind of you know um, cool. You know, so it is like. Uh, due to immoral, when our mind is burning with the fire of immorality, you know, through our improper, improper, uh, you know, unwholesome behavior and action through body, speech and mind, then the, the practice of moral is like a, putting a cool water on that fire, that cool down, you know, and so that is, um, so that is um, Shila or the moral discipline, you know. Um, so it really helps to the moral um, discipline is the very foundations for other practice, such as, you know, material concentration and the wisdom, you know, um, in terms of the practice of Tirihaya training to free from the samsara, the delusions. Buddha taught of three higher training, the higher training of wisdom and meditation and uh, moral discipline. And each of them act as a foundation to the next level of the practice. So the moral discipline is a very root and foundation of all those the other practices. You know, um, Narajuna, therefore Narajuna uh, he says, you know, just at the earth is the very, um, basis for all the plant to grow same way the moral discipline is the basis for all the plan of spiritual realizations um, um virtues uh, to inner virtues to grow you know so therefore again very important practice in terms of um, how that act as a very very uh, hmm? important part of the practice, uh, one of the very important practice. And the moral discipline, you know, very the foundation of moral discipline, you know, help us to cultivate love, compassion, and enlightenment, you know, um, because the, the practice of moral discipline is to practice from restraining through our body and speech and mind to hurt and harm anyone. So moral discipline, the practice is you don't, we, we restrain or reframe or avoid, avoid harming another beings, either through our physical behavior, expression, or through speech or through our mental state. And so when we practice to avoid such actions and refrain from that, then it helps us to cultivate love and compassion because love and compassion is not only we don't want to harm others, but we want to help others. And so then, uh, then again, it, it really helps to develop our love and compassion to become more stronger and stronger and lead to the enlightenment quicker and quicker. 
Right. So again, um, the importance of that practice, and you know, uh, also in terms of a better future lives, you know, also the moral discipline is the very uh, root cause of that, uh, and is a, a, a root cause uh, for the foundation for the um, you know enlightenment. So. Mm. And in terms of the both set of moral discipline, you know, then there is a moral discipline of reframing or avoiding from the misdeeds, unwholesome actions. And there is a, you know, such as, again, uh, you know, restraining from any of the 10 non, non virtuous actions that are harmful to other sentient beings, you know. Um, and then, um, the moral discipline of, you know, um, engaging other virtuous practice within the practice of the moral discipline. So, you know, on the basis of moral discipline, then engaging other virtues, such as, you know, making offering to three jewels, you know, um, practicing uh, charity to those who are in the needs and those poor and helping and those who are more vulnerable and, uh, and all other virtuous practices based on the foundation moral discipline. On the based on moral discipline, then you engage in other virtues, you know. And then the moral discipline of helping and benefiting others, you know. Those are the three kind of the main both sort of moral discipline, you know. And, um, and again, not only you, so, on the basis of moral discipline, that is to avoid engaging in any actions through any of the doors that can be help that can be harmful to others. But not only you don't harm others, avoid harming others, but you try to help and benefit others. On the basis of that foundation, moral discipline, then trying to help and benefit other sentient beings. You know. And not only help and benefit other sentient beings, but trying to help and benefit other sentient beings, you know, on the basis of the Dharma, on the basis of the moral discipline, you know. Not like you help someone and hurt someone else to do that. Do you get it? It's like you, you steal from someone and then you give to someone. You are helping someone, but you are hurting someone, you know, or trying to, you know, um, so something like that. And so then, you know, um, not like that when the both set of us uh, practice the, the moral discipline of benefiting and helping others, you know, one is based on the moral discipline, not hurting and harming on the foundation of that. Then on top of that, then you try to be help and benefit as much as you can according to your own ability and capacity, you know. Um, Mm. So that is a little bit on the, uh, the wealth of moral discipline, okay? Um, and then next one you see generosity, the wealth of the, the wealth of the generosity. Again, the generosity is the mind, mental state to give, you know? And if you have that mental state to give, and if you have something physical to give, you will be able to give because you have the wish to give. You know? And if you don't have, even you don't have any physical things to give, but when you have that thought to wanting to help, wanting to give, that is self generosity. You know? Someone who doesn't have any material things, okay? Someone who doesn't have any material things, someone like Milereva, you know, he doesn't have any material belonging, anything to share and give. But when he sees someone in a pain and suffering due to lack of material things, wealth, he really feel, he wish he can give something. He really feel, he wish he can help them by providing whatever their needs are. And that state of mind is the generosity. And when we have that kind of mind, and if we have the 
the, the, the things, the object, the well to offer and to give. Definitely when you have that mind driven mind, then we will be able to share, we will be able to give, you know. And so, uh, and so the practice of the generosity, when you train your mind in that way, then it helps us to reduce our sense of greediness, sense of mindlessness, sense of feeling, you know, not having enough, you know. That is what it does. The sense of our mindlessness that no matter how much we have, sometimes we feel we don't have enough to give or share, you know. We we are unable to give or practice generosity because we still feel we don't have enough to give. And sense of poor, you know, poverty is a, is a mental state of poverty because you, you still feel you don't have enough. You know? Whereas the practice of generosity is that even you have very little, you feel you have more than you need. You know, it's a feeling of richness inside even though you might not have so much but in your mind you feel you have so much to give you know? hmm? and so that is the, the practice of generosity you know um, and again you know when we have that feelings of wanting to give help and when you, on top of that, when you are able to give and practice it generously, then again, it, it support, it support our uh, feeling of love, compassion, bodhicitta mind to grow and to increase and improve, you know. Um, it support the practice of compassion, the loving kindness and bodhicitta mind uh, as well, you know. Um, hmm? And then, of course, in terms of the practice of generosity, you know, then there is a practice of generosity of material things. There's a practice of um, generosity of, you know, knowledge, wisdom, you know, um, in general, and especially Dharma knowledge, Dharma wisdom, you know, and the giving, sharing of that, you know, the generosity of showing and giving love, compassions and you know um, fearlessness or protecting someone who is going through fear helping them to overcome the fear and protecting saving and protecting them you know and so again those are some of the practice that different the different practice of generosity that one can um, engage into you know uh, when we talk about generosity, we always think only one thing is not always just the material things. You know, there is many other way that we can practice generosity. Even you don't have so much material things, you know. Um, and sometimes, uh, I think, in, especially in our now is the world, you know, sometimes you feel um, the generosity of uh, love is um, more needed in the love of material things sometimes, you know. I think in our this time, the society had that problem. The society had problem. A lot of people in the society have problem, mental, emotional problems. Why did you have that mental, emotional problem? Because, you know, they didn't grow up receiving the love, you know, they didn't end up receiving the love when they are small, when they are growing up, you know. And that has strong impact in their mind and their growing up, you know. Lack of love, care, true love and compassion, care, and that affect individuals. And that those many individuals that affect the society, you know, and then the society has the problems to deal with, you know, and, and many of them, you know, to a certain degree, you know, of course, definitely, uh, many of them, 
probably need a medication, some help, but also they need the affections, the love. That is what really they need. And if they can really feel the true love and affections from another beings, you know, that could have strong impact in their healing, you know, and from their mental, um, emotional, mental problems that they are facing, you know. Um, so, so therefore, you know, um, yeah. Um, so anyway, so that is the general philosophy. Okay. Then the next one is the practice of inner um, well of learning. You know. Mm. As you can see in there, yeah. Mm. And learning, you know, um, here of course uh, mainly refer to the the practice, the learning and studying of the Dharma, you know. And Dharma is uh, the the method or the way to transform our mind, transform our attitude, transform our heart. You know, that's what Dharma is. You know. Uh, mm. The technique, the method, uh, the practice that help us to transform our mind, that help us to transform our attitude, you know. So learning such Dharma from a, you know, qualified uh, spiritual teachers, you know, uh, so, and then once we have learned it, then we we'll try to apply it. If you learn and if you don't apply, then you, get, you don't get the benefit. It's like you got the seed, but you never plant it. Do you get it? You went to the shop and got the seed, but you never plant it. So then you don't see any flowers in your garden. So learning is receiving, is like buying the seed from the shop, you know? You learn all of that and next you have to plant it. The purpose of buying is to plant it. The purpose of learning is to put into the practice, applying it, implementing it. And when we implement it, when we practice, when we apply it, then then you begin to experience the result of that. Then you can see the flower growing and you can, you can enjoy the flower. You know, and so, um, so that is the purpose of learning. So it is important to uh, learn and having learned it, then really put into the practice. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, in one of the sutras, you know, um, the heap of jewels, in the sutra of the heap of jewels, there is a one section, you know, um, of, um, and in that it talks about how to make our learning pure, ten kind, uh, eight different ways, you know. So again, making our learning um, more pure by having the respect to the teachers, you know, from, where, from whom we are receiving and learning. That is one. Second, we can make our learning more pure by not having uh, or overcoming our own sense of arrogance and pride. Because sometimes, the more we learn, then we tend to become more arrogant because we feel we, we, you know, we have more knowledge, we have studied more, and so, and that, so when you do that, then again, you, you know, uh, your learning hasn't been, is not going in the right direction. So therefore, the more you learn, 
the more humble we should become, the more humility we should become, and less, you know, arrogant, you know. Um, and then, you know, by applying them, you know, with a joyous effort in our practice, when we learn and then cultivating a, a concentration, then we can again um, make our practice of the learning more pure, more um, complete, you know. Um, and when we learn, you know, uh, fourthly, you know, not forgetting them, you know, what we have learned. Sometimes we, we study, we learn so much, but then we don't pay strong attention. Then you know, we forget it. And next time after a few years or maybe even after a few months, when you hear it seems like you have never heard before. You know, because again, we forget, we forget, you know. And so when we study, when we learn, we have to really pay attention. More, more attention you pay, the more you can, uh, you know, keep in your mind and you can um, reclaim or recollect more. Remember, and if you have remembered, then you can apply more easily. And so therefore, um, that is, um, you know, um, and in order to not to forget, you know, it's not enough just hearing one time. You know, you have to reflect, contemplate on that. Maybe if you are writing a note, just not writing and then you never read it. And you have, you know, then you might have, you know, um, garbage of all notes, which you have read, written over so many times, but you have never read it. You know, I will read later, put it there, again that, and, but actually reading it, going through it. So if you revisit, then it helped to remind, you know, even the experience are like that. You know, like a um, certain experience of myself when I was young, you know, because I never revisited them, many of those experiences are gone. But some of the experience, because I revisited them, thought about them, so they keep, they are very fresh, still remember those and very fresh. And same thing, you know, uh, in the study, it's the same thing if you kind of revisit, read it, then it can retain in your memory and you have access to that when you need it. Um, otherwise, we hear and then again we forget. Mm. And then, you know, another way of kind of retaining those um, informations uh, in our mind is by explaining to others, by discussing with others, by sharing with others. Because when you need to share, when you need to discuss, when you need to, um, you know, um, teach, whatever, you know, then again, because you have to think about that. And so you are revisiting, you know, so therefore, again, that is one way that how it, it can make our practice, uh, the, the study learning more stronger and uh, so that we have more stronger retain of that, you know. And another uh, way to make it more pure is, you know, not praising oneself and not criticizing others, you know. And again, the purpose of learning is to practice and transform our mind. And the way to transform our mind is to train our mind to be more kind comparisons, so, you know, and less ego, you know, to practice to have less ego. So not to try and repress ourselves because that can increase our ego, you know. Praising ourselves is kind of, uh, you know, kind of making your ego more stronger and not criticizing others because, you know, um, 
by criticizing. It doesn't necessarily, the other person doesn't change their behavior, their attitude, their actions, but it only hurts and harm. And, you know, yeah, I mean, we watch news and all kinds of things and we criticize and talk bad about this and that. But how does that really change in reality? Has those people changed? Because we criticize, you know? I doubt, you know? So what is the point of that? Creating negative karma, make our mind upset. And, and it doesn't change the reality. It doesn't change the person's attitude, the person's perceptions. It doesn't change the person's behavior. So, you know, so anyway, so if we don't have to criticize others, it's the best, you know. Um, you know. Um, and then um, seven, you know, um, contemplating on whatever we have learned, you know, again and again, um, very, uh, you know, uh, strongly, you know, again and again strongly, you know, um, reflecting, contemplating on that. Uh, so whatever you have practiced, whatever you have learned and study, you know, if we contemplate, reflect on that, then you know you'll become more, um, more and more. Your study become more and more profound. Your learning become more and more profound, and better. And then the eight. Lastly, you know, um, whatever we have learned, study, putting into the practice. That is the thing. That is the. The purpose of studying learning, as I mentioned before, is to put into practice. So in this sutta, it has mentioned that. Also, Lama Tsongkhapa, also in his Lamrim, he also says the same thing. He said, you know, he talked about the benefit of learning, so many uh, different, you know, benefit of learning. And then at the end of that, when he summarized, then he said, the very purpose of learning is to put into the practice. The very purpose of the learning is to, to put into the practice. Therefore, try to apply as much as possible according to your capacity, ability to try to implement and put into the practice what one, what one has learned, you know. And also we can see that differences, you know. There are so many people who have learned so much, you know, or learn all, you know, um, including like myself, you know, I study, you know, what, you know, I continue to study. I study, you know, 30 years, you know, uh, in terms of just learning itself, you know, I've learned so much, you know, there's a lot of information, um, but doesn't mean that I'm better than someone who have, been, who have been learning only for a couple of years or one year. Someone who have learned recently, but then they have put into the practice, implement it, you can see them transforming and changing. Changing their, their attitude, their perceptions, changing their behavior, positive changes. And whereas someone like me might not have that change, even though I have all these studies. So therefore, you know, that's the key. That's the key, you know. And um, sometimes we can kind of make a uh, judgment on the basis and, oh, that person has been, you know, Buddhist monks, nuns for 20 years, or they have been studying 40 years and or as a lay practitioner, but still you don't see much changes. So therefore, uh, you know, maybe what is the point of studying all of that? Well, you know, because 
if those of those who have not changed a lot of time, they didn't put in the practice. They learn it, but they never put in the practice. If someone really put in the practice, you know, even if you have not learned so much, still you will see positive changes. You know, positive changes, transformation will definitely happen. Even if you have, have not a great studies, but if you have really tried to put into the practice, implement it, whatever you have studies, learn. You know, so, um, so that is the last, you know, that is, um, and, and in another sutra, you know, where it says, you know, one should never be kind of satisfied, you know, normally, again, uh, you know, the Buddha, we all encourage to be, you know, um, contentment, you know, contentment, you know, but again, when you are really practicing the Dharma and studying, learning about the, that, then we shouldn't be so content. With the material, external things, we should be content. But when it comes to the uh, internal wealth, study, practice, we, you know, until we achieve the goal, enlightenment, we should never be kind of content. And therefore, in, in a sutra that has been uh, you know, asked and requested by the uh, the king of the Naga, you know, the other king of the Naga in their um, the Buddha says, you know, um, Buddha says the both sides of us, you know, they have cultivated the wisdom, they have cultivated the wisdom through learning. You can see the bodhisattvas who have cultivated the wisdom by learning. And because that wisdom is a result of the learning, therefore, the bodhisattvas, you should never be content in terms of learning and you should continue to learn, study, you know. Hmm. And then he said also, you know, I've seen the bodhisattvas, you know, through the learning, who have overcome regret and the doubt. And therefore, I see that. And therefore, one should, it's a result of the learning. And therefore, again, one shouldn't be um, content with the learning and continue. You know? And again, Buddha says, you know, the both sort of us I've seen, you know, through learning, their delusion has become less. And their, um, their you know, positive state of mind have increased and that come through the learning and therefore do not be content with in terms of learning, in relation to learning. And again, another, you know, I've seen, uh, I see the Bodhisattvas, you know, in order to liberate the, the delusion of other sentient beings, the, abandoning or uh, destroying their own delusions and that come through i see that is the result of the learning and therefore you know um, you should never be um, content with the uh, the learning okay mm. Mm. so that is um I think one of the one of them I think is missing, but it's okay. I don't seem to. So that is learning. So that is one of the inner area wealth, the learning of the the Dharma, you know, and then decency, you know, um, and decency is the the practice of you know um, is another virtuous mind, you know, is a virtuous mind. Mm. And the dissensus is like, you know, the mind which restrain from engaging any unwholesome actions or behavior, you know, due to consideration of others, you know, due to consideration of others, you know, 
when we feel like we want to say something, when we feel like we want to act in a certain way, or when you feel like that, you know, uh, you need to express certain your strong emotions, you know, then you see, oh, you know, oh, I shouldn't do that. You know, I shouldn't act that way because, you know, it will hurt others, it will harm others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So having consideration for others, you know. Mm -hmm. In that, that kind of decency or concentration, virtuous mind is help to protect our other virtues. It helps to protect other other virtues, you know, and it has uh, the forces, the ability to overcome the the um, you know the negative, the opposite that is non considerations, non decency towards others, you know, having no consideration for others, you know. Doesn't care whether it hurts someone or not, doesn't care whether it hurts, harm someone or not. Do you get it? Sometimes we feel like, I don't care whether it hurts or harm that person or not, I just want to express it. I just have to say it. You know, because that, you know, that 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 goes against um, the very root of both sort of practice, love, compassion. Um, you know, not wanting to hurt and harm. You know, instead wanting to help and benefit others. You know, so therefore, you know, in terms of having a considerations, it's very important. Uh, you know. Um, hmm? So one of the problem with our modern, you know, so-called uh, democracy and um, individual rights, you know, I can do whatever I want. I don't care what my neighbors feel, what others feel, you know. That is not having a considerations, you know decency or considerations that create a lot of negative energies in the society because i'm in consideration i'm if i'm not consideration if i'm in consideration i don't care what my neighbor will say or think or whether it will disturb them or not by playing a very loud music uh, or doing all the other kind of things because i can do what i want then that they, they also get upset and they will do the same way and then it, get, it make me upset. Next time they become loud. And then we started to kind of, you know, have a bad feeling to each others, negative feeling to each others, you know, and all kinds of things because this due to lack of consideration for others, due to lack of consideration for others, you know. When you started to consider for others, you know, even though you know I want to be, I want to shout and be a little loud, but you know, because if I do that, you know, it could disturb the others. So therefore, I try to be not too loud and not to uh, shout too too strong, you know. And that is that kind of thinking and actions support the practice of love and compassion, care about others, others' feelings. He said about caring others' feelings, you don't want to hurt others' feelings. So therefore it's, it, it supports that kind of practice, is a kind of supportive for, uh, you know, um, the love, compassion, both in the mind, you know, having that kind of consideration, I you know. Um, mm. Mm. 
So that is, and then the next is self control, you know. Uh, that one of the, the other inner virtues. And self control is the mental, virtuous mental state, you know. That again, when we feel like, you know, again, we might be engaging in the, either through physical, verbally, or mentally, that could be harmful, unwholesome, non virtuous, you know. Again, then avoiding doing that, you know, restraining or reframing doing that from your own reasoning, you know, by thinking, you know, how can I do that? I'm supposed to be a monk. How can I do that? I'm supposed to be a Buddha's follower. How can I do that? I'm supposed to be a practitioner of Bodhisattvas. How can I do that? You know, I have taken those vows. How can I do that? You know. So again, your own through your own reasoning, you know, and um, so then again, you know. Um, restraining, refraining from any kind of harmful, uh, you know, hurtful, you know, non-virtuous action through body and speech mind by understanding with, due to that understanding coming from due to, you know, not because what others might think or say or how, uh, whether it might hurt, uh, uh, whether it might, um, um, you know, other might be disturbed or not, but because, you know, as a Buddhist practitioner, it's not right to do that. As a Buddhist follower, that is not right to do that, you know. So like that, through that kind of reasoning, then you try to, kind of same con self control, you know, so that you can, you don't engage into a certain unwholesome, unvirtuous actions that can be harmful to others in oneself and both. Mm. And then the wisdom, you know, um, those, then the, the, the inner well of the wisdom, you know. Mm. And that is the seventh one, you know, the inner world, you know, again, you know, um, so we know uh, the wisdom is the mental state that is able to distinguish right and wrong, you know, white as white, black as black, you no know, being mixed, you know, Virtues as virtues, non-virtues as non-virtues. So whatever it is, you know, knowing as as it is, as the reality itself, whatever whatever reality that is, you know, um, not being mistaken, not being ignorance, not having a doubt, too minded, but knowing um, whatever it is, you know, and especially, uh, you know. Um, so when you have the wisdom, then you don't get kind of misled. When you don't have mis uh, wisdom, then you can be easily misled, you know, by others. But when you have the wisdom, then the wisdom will help you to clear, um, you know, being misled and misunderstood and um, doubt and all of that, you know. And, um, and of course, there are many different kind of wisdom, you know many different level of wisdom, but in general, you know, we can say, you know, the wisdom that understand or relies the ultimate reality or truth, and the wisdom that understand and rely the relative or conventional um, reality and the truth, you know, and uh, both, of, both of them are equally important, both of them equally important. Um, we cannot we cannot ignore either of those wisdom, you know, both of them are equally. And got the conventional, the wisdom that relies the conventional wisdom, support the wisdom that relies ultimate truth, and the wisdom relies on the ultimate truth, also support the wisdom relies on the relative or conventional truth or reality. So we need, and those true wisdom 
are the very source of you know enlightenment and it's that wisdom that can cut the very root of all our problem all the afflictive emotions all the destructive emotions and the very root of those destructive emotions the fun fundamental ignorance you know and when we are free from the fundamental ignorance then we are free from the, all the delusions that arises due to that fundamental ignorance. And when there is no more delusion that disturb our mind, then we have peace, true peace, inner peace. You know? And then we don't create any more negative karma. We don't create any karma. And then you know, there is no more samsaric birth. And if there is no more samsaric birth, then there is more, no more samsar, there is no more suffering. That is end to the suffering. You know. Then there is end to the suffering. You know, permanent end, not temporary end, but permanent end to the su suffering. And permanent end to suffering can be achieved when there is no more the cause that lead to the suffering. That is the karmic seed. And that karmic seed. Is there because there is a delusions due to that those delusions that will create those karmic karmic actions and have the karmic seed or potential. And when there's no more delusion, there's no more creating of no more karmic potential or seed. You know, and and we can stop the delusions. We can destroy the delusions when we destroy the very root of the delusions, when we cut the very root of the delusion, the fundamental ignorance. And in, in order to cut the very root of all this delusion, the fundamental ignorance, then we need the sword of the wisdom sword that realizes the two truths, especially the ultimate truth. You know, we need that, that sword to cut that. And so, therefore, these are the five inner wealth known as Arya wealth, you know, inner wealth. And, um, and so, once we have cultivated those inner Arya wealth, you know, then as it is said here, it doesn't ever run out, you know, unlike like the material wealth, you know. There's no danger of being losing it. There's no danger of being, you know, um, destroyed by others. There's no danger of being stolen by others. There's no danger of being cheated by others, you know. Um, so you continue to carry without any fear, worry, you know, make your mind calm, peaceful, you know. And that help in your, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, your mind to be more calm, peaceful throughout your life, you know, no matter what the external situation, because you have those inner wealth, those quality, the external factors doesn't affect you so much. You know, things, external things going up and down, the weather change, you know, Sometimes there is too much snow, sometimes there's no snow, sometimes there is too much rain, sometimes there's no, sometimes it's too cold, sometimes it's too hot. You know, you know, sometimes we have we make a lot of money, sometimes we don't make, sometimes we lose, you know. Sometimes we make a friend, new friends, good friends, and sometimes we lose friends, you know. Sometimes things go as we want, sometimes things doesn't go well, sometimes we are healthy, sometimes we are not healthy. All of that doesn't affect your mind to be so fluctuated up and down, but instead, due to those inner wealth, you can keep my, your mind more stable, calm, peaceful, you know, through that kind of kind, peaceful, stable mind, you know, not only it helps your mind, it also will help also to have a more emotional and physical health as well. And not only it helps on so many different levels in this life, you know, while we are still alive, definitely at the time of the 
when the death comes, you know, we have the, the tools, the things to deal with, you know. When normally, when, when we don't have those tools, when the dead, when the dead come, when, the, when you feel dead is very close and real, we might have a lot of negative emotions that can disturb us, you know. You know, feeling of guilt, you know, because we remember what we did in our life, you know, remorse, regret, those can appear. Even if it's not appearing at that point, it can. You know, sometimes maybe there are a lot of other emotions, kind of, you know, anger and resentful that we have not been able to deal with. We haven't solved that. Those could arise at that moment, those difficult times, because you are so in such much uh, physical and uh, mental situation, pain and that, and then all this, all this garbage that we have been holding can manifest anytime now. And that can disturb our mind a lot. You know. All the strong attachments, even though now you feel you don't have a strong attachment, but at that time, the feeling of attachment, because you are going to be separated from all, all the things that we love and we are very attached to, you know, our families, friends, our belongings, you know, our identity, our name, fame, because we are going to lose all of them, then we might have, you know, fear, worry, attachments, all these different emotions could arise and can make our final transitions, death, quite miserable, quite painful, could be, you know. But if we have those inner, um, you know, well, as is described, then we don't have to go through all of this, you know. You have all this practice, all these inner qualities that can deal with any of those emotions, any of that, that will not bother you, that will not be able to disturb your mind. So you, we can pass very peacefully, have a peaceful transit, transitions to the next stages, you know. And after that, you know, if there is something that we can carry and continue to work on, it is those inner wealth, not the external wealth. When we die, we leave everything behind. We can't carry anything. So it's not no more help anymore. But this inner, this inner wealth will be very helpful at the time of parto, intermediate stage, and it will be very helpful also after the birth. And, you know, and definitely, definitely it leads to the enlightenment. So therefore, that is why, you know, um, here, Adisha is advising, inspiring us to put effort to cultivate those inner call inner wealth or area wealth instead of ignoring them or neglecting them and just focusing too much on external wealth. You know, of course, we do need some external wealth to survive and to have the basic, you know, basic that we need. But um, you know, to spend all our mind, all our energy, all our life just for that. Is it that worthy? That is something we have to kind of think of. Or, you know, it's important for me to pay also attention to other, other spiritual path as well, you know. You know. Um, it's important to balance. Important to balance, you know. It is important to balance because, of course, we have to make living. We have to have pay the bill. We need the basics. So therefore, we cannot kind of totally ignore, uh, you know, working and um, you know accumulating some things that we need to support. But also, we shouldn't be just concerned with just that one. We should be also balanced and also work on our spiritual practice on our mind. And balancing is the key. Balance is the key, you know. Um. Mm.
So that so there is a one caution where it says, do we take those well to the next life? Yes, those internal well we take. That is why like when some people from the very young children, they are born with extremely compassionate nature. Do you know? Without being taught, trained, they are born naturally very loving and compassionate. That is that they are caring from the past. You know? Some of them from the very young, very talented, very sharp-minded, extremely sharp-minded, genuine and different. Where did that come from the past? They're caring, you know, from the past. And so definitely those inner qualities, because it's the state of mind, you know, and our mind continue. Our body doesn't continue, but our mind continue. Caring all those, um, you know, imprint and the mind itself, different mind. And so that is where we, we can carry the, uh, those well, internal well in us, you know. And, um, and that is why, you know, some many teachers, like he's holding the Lama says, you know, like when he was studying, you know, there are certain points, difficult points, you know, even some of the great Geshe struggles, you know, to really grasp the understanding of those are some of the, the subtle and difficult points. But his holding is found very easy, even as a young boy. You know, he found very easy to understand those difficult and subtle points, whereas some of the great geishas who have learned 40, 50 years, and not only geishas who are really good ones also, even though they also struggle some of those difficult, subtle points. And again, it's because, again, it's caring from the past, you know, caring from the past. So, so definitely, definitely that is what we can carry, you know. Um, yeah. And even, uh, even within the, my own family, I see now, I see, um, and I can only think that those qualities, they come from the past because in this life, I, I don't see them where it comes from, you know, um, certain relative, certain family members, you know, extremely kind compassion, extremely kind compassions, even though it is not like they have studied a lot and they have practiced a lot. You know, just by nature from the young is very compassionate, caring nature. And then there are some others who doesn't have, even though you grow up in the same kind of environment with same kind of everything, but who doesn't seem to have same level of kindness, caring nature, you know. And so again, you know, um, it, it is it's the continuity from the past, you know. Uh, so yeah. And then next is where the advice, leave all busyness and distracted distraction behind and do all in, instead in the seclusions and solitude. You know, and so when we when we talk about busyness and distractions, we can think of external busyness and distraction, internal busyness and distractions. When you talk about <coughs> seclusion and solitude, we can talk about external as well as internal. So the most important is the internal one, okay? Because you might have been free from all the external busyness and uh, distraction, but your mind can be easily distracted and busy with all the thoughts going all over the world. Do you get it? And probably sometimes you will notice when you do retreat, in a very quiet place where there's no one, 
but your minds are running everywhere around the world, busy, you know. So external seclusions or solitude didn't really help your mind, you know, unless we put effort, you know. But definitely it will be for beginner, you know, for the beginner practitioners, you know, for the someone who doesn't have a strong meditation, who doesn't have a strong practice, for the beginner, definitely external conditions where there is less things to do, you know, less things to worry. So business distractions and where, you know, is more solitude, is uh, reclusion can help in our practice. Definitely, there is no doubt about that, you know. To be free from the external, but you know, also it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily bring internal, free from internal busyness and distractions, unless we work with our mind. Okay. And so the here is, and especially, um, you know, we, when we are busy with our life, we have responsibility, you know, uh, for, you know, your partners, your children, your families, societies, all of that, you cannot just kind of run away, you know. You have those responsibility as well. You have, you have to make your own living, you know, to pay those. So we can, even though we cannot have that, but at least we try to create more seclusions and, uh, you know, solitude mind, okay? Trying to create more mind that is free from too much dis distraction and busyness. And we learn through the meditations, you know. So, you know, mindfulness meditation can be helpful to do that. Concentrations, mindfulness meditation can help, you know to dissolve all this busy mind, all this distraction mind, you know, instead of just focus on the bread, for example, you know, whatever object that you choose, any object you choose to keep, um, focus your mind on, you know, whatever you, just trying to focus that mind and not allowing other mind to kind of manifest and get too busy, you know, and run around and chase around in your mind, you know, um, and so, and we can train to do that even in an external busy environment, even in the external busy and uh, uh, environment still, if you try to practice, if you try to train, if you try to learn still, you can keep your mind from being too busy and from being too distracted. And that is what we need to do. And as Lama Sobharam Bhasya always says, when we say retreat, you know, not just external retreat, it has to be internal retreat, you know. Sometimes when we think about retreat, we only think about external retreat, but you know, um, because your mind might be, again, as I said, if you are, your mind is not, your mind is not retreat, then your mind is everywhere. You are not in retreat. Your body is in retreat, your mind is not in retreat, you know. Your body is in solitude, but your mind is not in solitude. Your body is in seclusion, but your mind is not in seclusions. No. And so, uh, remembering and understanding that, and then trying to trying to create that kind of mental state, you know, is important, so that we can have a stronger and better practice. Whatever practice, whatever meditation we do, that then it uh, so then you know we can the practice the meditation become more strong, more powerful because your mind is not so distracted, your mind is not so busy with other things, but your mind is with with in the moment with that whatever you are trying to practice and meditate, and so um, that is. Um, Okay, so that is mental state, mental. Then in terms of the speech, you know, it says refrain, refrain from meaningless chatter. 
and always keep check on what you say. You know, so again, uh, you know, saying, you know, we have to watch our, our mind, our mouth, you know. Sometimes when we charge so much, you know, you have nothing to charge it, just then you start to talk about someone. You know, isn't it? After some time, there isn't much to talk about yourself. You, you, you update you are, what you have been doing that, and then, then, you, then what to talk about, then we talk about politics, that is talking about someone else there, talking about this and that, that person and this and that. And it is all meaningless charted because it doesn't serve, it doesn't have meaning, really meaning, you know. We talk and talk and talk, disturb one's mind, you know. I talk about politics, this and that, and it disturb other persons. That person talk about this and that, and then it disturb my mind. We both get we both get disturbed uh, disturbed by that conversations, and our mind go here and there, and it doesn't change the reality. It doesn't change the reality. That just chattering doesn't change the reality until we take certain actions. If there is something we can do, you know, and then then we create negative karma and you know this type of other is some either it makes someone angry because of the discussion we have about the quality or it either it makes angry it makes people depressed it makes other people depressed helpless hopeless discouraged um, or frustrations all of those it give kind of fuel to all those different negative emotions to arise. You know. By the time we finish our conversations, you know, many negative emotions arise and it's disturbing our mind. And other person's mind, you know. So having less chat is better. You know, when it's needed, you chat it for meaning, you know, uh, kind of meaningless gossiping, you know. Um, it's entertaining, but it's entertaining, you know, um, but it doesn't really serve good purpose. It only creates um, negative consequences, you know. Um, for everyone. And then as he says, you know, um, always keep check on what you say, you know, be very mindful, very mindful of what you say. If you are not mindful of what you are saying, even if you have no intention to say something as hurtful, but sometimes people get hurt. And you know? not because you have an intention to hurt them, but because we are not mindful of what we said not mindful of the word which sometimes it is a wrong choice of the word. Sometimes it's the kind of the, the tone of the word, the tone of the, the speech. And if we're more mindful, maybe we will keep able to keep it the tone better. That might be less hurtful for others. Or we might be able to find better choice of the words that might be less harmful for that person. Or sometimes, you know, yeah, um, and you share something that you don't mean to share or you are not supposed to share, you know, you already share and you wish that you didn't say it, you wish you could take it back. Do you get it? But you can't take it bad. And if we we're more mindful and watchful, check, maybe we might not we might not have done that. You know. So and so therefore um, speech can be extremely powerful in terms of encouraging, giving a confidence, 
or destroying and disturbing and discouraging and all of that as well. Speech can be sometimes more powerful than the, the physical action itself in a good way, bad way. You know, so we have to be very careful how we use our speech, you know. I guess maybe at the moment, you know, one of the things that is going in the world and especially in these countries, uh, you know, is due to a lot of the speech, you know, is due to the speech, you know. All the disruptions, distractions, all the negative things happening is due to certain individual speech, you know. Speech has very, very strong power, impact. It, as I mentioned, to you, we can use it in a, in a positive way or in a negative way. We, and in a bold way, it can be very strong and effective. And so therefore, being very mindful, because sometimes when you talk about Dharma, you know, well, we think we just need to work with our mind. That is the main thing. We, sometimes we forget that and then ignore our speech. Do you get it? Feeling those are not important, speech and our actions. What is the only the mind, you know? And so again, being very mindful because even your speech can have a very, very strong impact on, on that. Uh, Uh, so there is, um, there is, let me see, there is one. If I seem to carry a lot of sadness and regret in this life, are there some specific practice that you recommend to help me keep in balance? Um, regret itself is, you know, I think not a bad. I, I will describe two kinds of regret, you know. Uh, positive regret, negative regret, you know. Uh, positive regret is something that we actually encourage to do, like when you practice the four opening powers, purifications, you know. And negative regret is something that we try to overcome. And the way I understand is negative regret, unhelpful negative regret is you cannot overcome it. You know, you just get stuck in the past because of whatever we did, you know, we get stuck in that and not being able to move forward, you know. Uh, and sometimes that is because like, it feel like we cannot fix. It's something damage we have done that cannot be fixed, you know. But the positive regret is you acknowledge the mistake that we have done, but then we understand we have the ability to transform and change it and move forward and not to hang on that. So it, it, it is a step, regret is the step that lead to the next step to move forward for the change and transformations. You know, the mistake we have made that can be transformed and changed. So I think having that deep understanding can be helpful. First of all, you know, really deep understanding, you know, um, that um, those whatever, negative karma, we might have created whatever unwholesome actions we might have created, those can be purified, those can be purified, those can be purified. And uh, so we don't have to hang on that, uh, but just acknowledge and just move forward and trying to uh, change that and not to, not to create some kind of negative karma actions in the future. And for whatever had done, doing whatever different form of purification we do, and with total convictions that they can be purified, those can be purified, you know. Um, and and so I think that, um, and I think maybe sadness also can can come because of that, you know, that something we did something that feel like that uh, you know uh, we shouldn't have done, and. Uh, uh, because of all of that, you know. So again, same thing, you know. Feeling sadness itself is not a bad itself, you know. It's a normal for us as a human beings to have even regret, 
sadness, all different emotions. It's a, just a natural um, for us, everyone to have, you know. Um, but as long as we don't allow ourselves to be consumed by them, whether it's a feeling of sadness, whether it's a feeling of regret, all of that. As long as we don't allow our mind to be consumed by that, that feeling, that energy. Um, having that moment of that is not a problem. You know, you can have that moment, you notice that, you are aware of that, and you know that it is something you need to work on, you need to work on practice. So it is a, in a way, it is a good because it's a reminder that we need to do something and then we forgot about it and then something, you know, the alum says, hey, you need to do this, you know. And so in a way, it is a good, it is a reminder for our practice. It's a reminder of that. But the point is that we don't allow it to consume by that in that state of mind. If that happens and it, it can it become distractive and uh, unhealthy. But just having once a while, just a moment, uh, I don't think it's a, you just notice it, you just await it and, and then just let it go, you know? So, yeah. And then there is another question. Uh, where did the seven reasons of Arya come from? So, um, Oh, there, there, there are many, 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 many texts. You know, it, it, it is in, uh, you know, materials, um, uh, ornament of clear realization, and many, many other um, scriptures. So then, there is one question. My husband says he need to vent about quality. I prefer not to get into the emotional dialect. Am I being? Uncompassionate if I always said I don't want to talk about it or ignore the conversations. This upset him. Yeah, it is a tricky. I think. Yeah, I think um, it's a tricky. Um, I wish I had the right, correct answer to that. You know, um, because sometimes I myself might have similar situations. You know. Um, mm. But I think, you know, better to uh, not really engage because if you engage it, then if it's going to disturb both your mind, why engage it? At least not doing that, it upsets his mind. But by engaging, it might upset both of your minds, you know? And um, and probably with the time, the other person will have to, he or she will understand, you know, he or she doesn't want to get in this conversation and they will, they will be okay with that. And they, they will not just get, at the very beginning, they might be upset because this is something they want to do and they like to do it. And, um, you know, but with the time, you know, and especially if you explain why you don't want to get it, because as much as you want to help and support him by getting that kind of conversation, but just letting him know that, you know, it disturbs your minds and, uh, and also it might be disturbing his mind. And, um, and so for that very reasons, you know, that is the only reason why you don't want to engage because you don't have the tools to work to keep your mind calm when you discuss in that kind of conversations and it disturb and upset your minds and uh, others. So therefore that is the only reason why you, you don't want to engage in that. So maybe the other person also understand that when you give your point of view, you know, truly, you know, uh, and then um, with the time they will be able to kind of you know, not be so upset and just accept, you know, and um, so then they can talk with other people who also share similar, you know, who like to talk politics. So then they can have the conversations, you know, among themselves. Um, so, you know, that is all I can kind of, um, that's all I can kind of think. Um, so then there is one question. I think this might be the last question. So 
I think I will, that, after that, yeah. It seems we should usually be cautious with speech and maybe refrain from speaking. But is there any situation where it is important to speak? Maybe some of us might be afraid to speak up, even when speaking up could help others. For example, by protecting others or pursuing others to act in a better way. Can we please comment on these situations? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, um, first of all, is here the, uh, the Adisha or any of the you know, other teachings, you know, they never discourage from speaking up, you know. Um, it's more of here is saying to kind of getting into meaningless gossip charges and also, you know, um, and so that is where it isn't a don't speak, but check before you speak. You know, it doesn't say you don't speak. It says be more mindful and check your check before you speak. So that is the important point. You know, speaking up is not a problem, but as you mentioned, we should speak when it is needed. You know, um, you know, people could people should stand up and speak where there is. You know, when in, injustice is being done and when there can be, uh, can help either, you know, anyone, you know, and so um, not only that, as in a both of the vows, when there is, a, when by speaking up, if you can help and if you don't do that, that is breaking a vows, you know, you should, so you should speak, you know, when by speaking up, it can help someone, it, it is going to protect someone, it is going to benefit. Then you should speak. Not speaking is actually um, the breaking of the vows of also. But when you have the opportunity to do that, to help someone by speaking up, so so therefore, so therefore, it never discourages from speaking. You know, you, um, and you you can see even with his holy the Lama, you know, he speaks his mind when he needs it. You know. When, different issue in the world, he speaks, you know, but it is always about what state of mind you speak. That is one thing, you know, that is the most important part. Are you speaking from the state of anger, frustrations, hatred, or are you speaking from the state of mind of more compassion, kind, or at least more kind of more stable, peaceful, undisturbed mind? Uh, and so those are those are the important factors. And if we uh, have more mindfulness, then definitely we will be able to check our mind before we speak. You know, what is the driving force for me to speak? You know, is this because of compassion, because I want to help someone, or is more of because I'm upset and angry with someone? You know, sometimes the man caused me my anger with someone. And then our, our delusion can kind of deceive us, feel like I'm speaking of to help the other person. But sometimes that is just an excuse. The more the main, main, main reason, because I'm upset about that and other persons, and I, I have to speak against that. So those are the things that we have to be more, what you call, um, honest with ourselves and watch our own mind and try to look what are the real intention motivations in speaking, in doing any actions? And then if our intentions are not the best, then trying to cultivate better intentions and then trying to speak or do with the better intentions. And so, yeah. Okay. I think that is all. So yeah, we can do the dedications. May all beings everywhere plagued by the suffering of body and the mind obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtues of my merit. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or evil fall ill. May no one be afraid or be little with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored, finding repose. May the naked find clothing, hungry find food. 
and made a thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth and those who with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicine be effective and wholesome prayer bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be free from their ailments. Whatever disease they are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightening cease to be afraid and those bound be free. May the powerless find power and may people think of inviting each other. As long as space remains, for as long as sentient things remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful July 4th weekend. Thank you.